Joining some friends of ours, we're on a fall cruise to the northeast. We started off in Boston, then to Bar Harbor, Maine, Halifax, Nova Scotia, Sydney, Charlottetown on Prince Edward Island, then on to Quebec City for three days before taking the return cruise back to Boston. We arrive in the late afternoon and meet up with our friends Candy and Joe at our hotel. We spend the rest of the day at a park across the street. That evening over happy hour we'll make our plans for the next day. The next morning we take the subway into downtown Boston. Our first stop is Quincy Market and Faneuil Hall. From there we decide to walk Freedom Trail and see the sights along the way. find our way to Boston Common, where we sit by the frog pond and have an Italian ice. Across the way is the Boston Public Garden and its iconic swan boats. From here we caught the tea back to our hotel, then a short shuttle to our ship, Holland America's Vendam. It's the smallest Holland America ship we've been on, only holding about 1,300 passengers. After a farewell toast to Boston, we're on our way to Bar Harbor, Maine. Bar Harbor gets its name from a sandbar between Bar Island and the main town. It's only exposed during low tide. During that time, you can drive across it to the island. We tendered to shore to catch our tour bus up to Cadillac Mountain with its gorgeous 360 degree view of the bay and the surrounding lakes. Trying to beat the rain, we head toward our bus to finish our tour of the Arcadia National Park. And we are influenced by the Labrador current, which comes from the north. And our water here is typically in the 50s, and it warms up into the 60s in the summer. So not as easy to go swimming here as at some beautiful beaches. But uh, that cold water is what provides us our great uh, sea life, including lobsters. Our tour continues through the park, heading back to Bar Harbor. This is a beaver pond, with their lodge prominently in the middle. We spend the afternoon wandering town and visiting the tourist shops along the way. Looking for a place to get out of the rain, we see a wonderful place overlooking the park. We enjoyed some local beer and hard cider as well as a warm artichoke dip served in a bread bowl. Back at the docks, we board our tender for a trip back to the ship. Our first stop in Canada is Halifax, in the province of Nova Scotia. I was surprised that we were greeted by bagpipe music. I didn't know there was still such a strong Scottish influence here in Eastern Canada. We have a private guide for the day. His name is Al, and he starts his tour off by showing us some of the more historic areas of town. He also explained that a lot of the stone used in the construction of the old buildings were originally ballast stones from England. We also saw a lot of wooden sculptures made from tree trunks, from trees that were killed from a hurricane eight years ago. Also, Halifax is where most of the bodies from the Titanic are buried. Al had some interesting stories regarding that. The story is that happened over a hundred years ago. Mr. Esme went to Mr. Freeman and said, uh, you, your family has worked for us for generations in the past, right? We're men, we're going to die on this boat. You let me go on the lifeboat, and I'll make sure your family has wealth for the rest of your lives, right? And Mr. Freeman said, no. The captain told me, women and children only on the lifeboats. Now, of course, Mr. Esme ends up in New York on the lifeboat. He said, how'd you get here? You're one of the richest men in the world. Why would you take a place from a woman on the lifeboat? He's, 
his story was he jumped on at the last minute, it was the last seat, there was room, nobody else around. That was his story, right? The story in the movie has a guy dressing like a woman. Now they've investigated it too, right? And so all of a sudden, of all these gravestones, there's only one that says erected by Mr. Bruce Esme, and it's that one there, right? So to me, that fits the story more than the other story. Our next stop is a local sugar shack, where they refine maple syrup. We got to sample the many grades of syrup and enjoy a lot of the sweets. On our way up the coast, Al drove us by some of the out-of-the-way neighborhoods, telling us about the economy and what they have to do to prepare for the cold winters. Just outside of Indian River, we stop at a local lobster shack to place our lunch order and learn about lobsters firsthand. This is the smallest one that we can catch and keep in Nova Scotia. It's one pound. It's about seven years old. And it's two and a quarter inches from the island to the end of the main body. They're actually a skeleton, so every year they shed their shell to grow a little bit bigger. And right now there's a lot of feed in the water. The ocean's very warm, so they could go from like a one pound to a pound and an eighth to this pound and a quarter. In a couple of years, a pound and a half. And a pound and three quarters and a two pound. So if you hear people talking about market size lobsters, these are the fiber, the most common market size lobsters. You notice that we taught them all how to wave goodbye. You know, <laughs> this is a female pound and three quarter lobster. When I looked in the tank, you can see she actually has a set of hips. Right here, yep, the flares, just like a set of hips. And this is the male, and he doesn't have a set of hips. And when you flip them over, this is almost, you can see how big that shell is. And there's a little bit of meat up here. And that shell, now she's past breeding for this year, she would have laid her eggs in late June or July. But they would have come out and they would have stuck to all these little hairs on the swimmerette, and they should wrap that big tail around and protect them until they hatch. Now you'll also notice that lobsters have two different sized claws. This is a large crushing claw. And when they hatch from the egg, it determines whether they're going to be male or female, or left-handed, or right-handed. So this has got the large crushing claw on the left, and the tearing claw on the right, and this one has the large crushing claw on the right, and the tearing claw on the left. So this is a left-handed lobster, and this is a right-handed lobster. And all lobsters are very well balanced. Even though they live in the ocean, they can be taught to do handstands. It takes some of them a little bit longer than others, but they all eventually learn how to do this. <laughs> As he displayed his various lobsters, he had an unusual blue one, said to be one in a million. He's, yeah, he's about six pounds, and there's a lot of lobsters in the what we call the three pound to eight pound range, and they are right here near the side, you know, near the shoreline and that. They'll wander out into deeper water, but. Al testifies that most of the time we have a 13, 14, 15 pounder in. The last one we had actually is in Switzerland. It was shipped a week, two weeks ago Saturday. Yeah. So do you, will you cook that one? Or? No, no, it's, it's a pet. It's more for show and tell. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we, we'd like to release it back in the water if we can. Yeah. Yeah. We each ordered up a pound and a half lobster to be cooked while we visited the quaint fishing village of Peggy's Cove. Peggy's Cove is quite small, just a few fishing shacks forming this small village, but the village itself dates back to 1811. There are a few fishermen still here, but mainly just local artists catering to the tourists. Al explained to us how the lobster traps worked. There are two separate rooms, the first one is called the kitchen where the bait is, and the second is called the parlor. If something scares the lobster while he's eating the bait, he'll try and swim away and get caught into the parlor. The idea of the trap is not to be too efficient. They want some of them to get away, including the smaller ones. He also brought some fish to lure some of the crabs and lobsters out from underneath the pier. Look, look at that guy. Whoa! Where? Crab. Oh Three my of goodness! Them. Are they gonna fight? Yeah, they'll fight. Ah. <laughs> they get any meat yet? No. Hey, you got a crab, I think. Oh, I got a crab instead. He got dessert. Didn't get dinner. Oh, look at that crab pulling there. Yeah. Crab going with it. That's a good-sized lobster. 
the other crabs, they just disappear when he come out. Oh, he got a piece of fish. Yeah, they don't have a trap down there. Not allowed. Unseasoned. Oh, are they? Yeah. Just south of town, sitting on a granite outcropping, is Peggy's Point Lighthouse. It marks the eastern point of Margaret's Bay and is still operated by the Canadian Coast Guard. Another highlight of Peggy's Cove is this carved granite relief. It was done in the 70s and depicts 32 Nova Scotian fishermen and their families enveloped by the wings of St. Elmo, the patron saint of sailors. So now it's back to riders for our rustic lobster lunch. <laughs> Again with some instruction from Al on how to tackle the beast, we dove in. With our stomachs full of lobster and oysters, we make the scenic drive back to Halifax. As our four-hour tour stretches in the six, we say goodbye to Al and manage to get some last-minute shopping in at the port before our ship sets sail. The next morning we're at Sydney, on the east coast of Cape Breton Island. We are greeted with Celtic music as we have breakfast on the Lido. On shore, we are greeted by what Cape Breton calls the world's largest Celtic violin, supposedly actually playable. Today, Marianne and I are off to the highlands of Bedeck and the Ishkaban Falls. Ishkaban means white water in Gaelic, the old language of Scotland. But first, to stop at a scenic overlook. We arrive in the beautiful forested mountains for our hour and a half round trip hike up to the falls. With the damp undergrowth, there was a large variety of mushrooms that I have never seen. The hike has been very picturesque and relaxing, and soon we hear the roar of the falls coming up from ahead. It's always interesting for us to see such lush, moss-covered landscaping. And of course on the way down, we saw more mushrooms. Back at the parking lot, we have a small box lunch waiting for us. This is one of the many wild apple trees we've seen. This area is also known as being the retirement home for Alexander Graham Bell. It includes this museum and a bronze of him and his wife, Mabel. After the nightly shows on the ship, we tended to spend some time at the sing-along piano bar. Yellow submarine, yellow submarine. We all live in the yellow 
The next day we're at Charlottetown on Prince Edward Island. We had read about a great farmer's market in town, so we got up early and took a cab to go visit. It turned out it really wasn't worth all the internet hype. So it was back on the bus for a tour of the island. Our first stop is a small fishing village called North Rustico. We traveled to the north end of the island, the Prince Edward Island National Park. Here we saw a lot of this wind and water etched sandstone. The highlight of this excursion is a visit to the Green Gables Farm, where Lucy Montgomery was inspired to write the series Anne of Green Gable. Now nestled in the middle of a golf course and catering to large flocks of tourists really took away from its charm. After being caught in the heavy downpour, we were moved on to the Prince Edward Islands Preserve Company, where we got to sample a lot of unique flavors of local jams and jellies. That night was another formal night for dinner as we headed on to Quebec, Canada.